I'm going to suggest we go ahead and start because we have a packed agenda today. So much to cover. We are so fortunate to have these amazing guests with us today from the Center for Community Resilience. And so I want to make sure that we have as much time as possible with them. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started and just say uh, welcome, everybody. It's good to see so many people on this Zoom meeting that again feels a little bit strange, but also like our part of our new normal to just be seeing faces on small screens. Uh, but it's nice to see so many of you today. Um, and just wanna extend a, a warm welcome to our first session of the Santa Cruz County ACES Network Learning Series. And this particular session is focusing on what we call the pair of ACES in practice. And today's event is being co-hosted by First Five Santa Cruz County with support from Core Investments, uh, which is a countywide collective impact movement that shares a lot of similar goals as First Five, as well as this ACEs movement. Um, and I just want to mention and point out some of the other team members from First Five and Core that are supporting the, all the logistics and the facilitation today. Um, we have David Brody and Christine Seberg from First Five Santa Cruz County. Do you wanna just wave on screen so we can see you? Uh, we also have Nicole Lezen, my co-facilitator for Core Investments. And Stella Lauerman is providing interpretation today. And so we've, um, we're all working together as a team here to make sure that if anybody needs any assistance or is having any trouble uh, following along that you can message any one of us and we'll uh, help you out. Um, and our session today was also planned in partnership with um, Susan Paradise from the Health Services Agency, the Public Health Department, uh, which is actually the official grantee for this ACEs Aware uh, grant in Santa Cruz County. Uh, our other planning partners are Najib Kamil from Human Services Department, the Family and Children's Services uh, Division, and Maritza Lara from Health Improvement Partnership uh, and they're also leading some other ACEs related activities. So you might be hearing about, you might have already heard about a lot of different ACEs activities happening in our county. Um, and while it might feel like, whoa, it's, it's hard to tell the difference between all these things, it's actually a really good thing that there's so much um, shared effort, coordinated effort. <clears throat> We're working really hard to make sure that we do this um, in partnership. And so again, we're really excited to start this uh, particular learning series featuring the Center for Community Resilience. Um, and uh, hope that you also agree with us that, you know, when we decided to uh, launch this learning series uh, with the Center for Community Resilience and their Parabasis framework, um, we really saw it as the potential for offering up a unifying framework for all these different initiatives, all these different efforts that happen in our county. So. We hope that through today's session, you'll, you'll walk away feeling the same way. So here's our agenda for today. We'll do some, a uh, little bit of welcome and overview and introductions. And then we're gonna turn it over pretty quickly to Wendy Ellis and Harrison Newton from the Center for Community Resilience. And they'll introduce us to their model and uh, what, what the center does, talk about trauma, equity and resilience. They've invited some of their partners that they work with in Cincinnati to also share with us uh, how they've incorporated um, this framework into their work. Um, and then we'll have time for uh, questions and a little bit of discussion before we go into breakout rooms to then talk about, well, how do, how do we take this model, these concepts, how do we uh, kind of marry it with what we already know, what we already do, but how do we use it to then uh, take it a step further or many steps further? So we hope that you all stay for the breakout groups. We know that sometimes that is the point where people <laughs> uh, leave or move on, but we really want to have uh, great discussions because this is not going to be a one-time discussion for us. We really wanna be able to build on it. Um, so we'll come back after the breakout of uh, reporting out and, and some more questions and discussion before we wrap up with our next steps in closing. So just wanna to mention too that we do have, um, our speakers and our and, and some other guests that are on the East Coast. And so, and, and I think even in the central time zone. So trying to remember when we talk about times uh, that <laughs> we're all a little bit on different clocks. So that's why you see different times here. 
And for those of you that joined after we did the little Zoom tour during our unofficial start, I'm just going to walk you through again some key things for how to participate today, uh, because we do want it to be interactive. So a couple of things, uh, again, to mute and unmute yourselves, find your microphone icon or press star six if you're calling on a phone. Uh, we do have Spanish interpretation, so you'll need to find the globe icon or tap your phone, I believe it's the more option, to select your language channel, either English or Spanish. And if you select Spanish, then also uh, select uh, mute original audio. And then we're asking you to rename yourselves, putting the letters of the language that you're listening in after it's just so that we know it helps us keep track. And just want to again remind you that we're recording this session today, except for the breakout. So if you don't want to be heard or seen on camera, then um, you can leave yourself muted and your camera off. And again, we encourage you to share your questions and comments in the chat throughout the session. Um, Nicole and Christine will be keeping track of those as we go through the session uh, to help pull out questions for the discussion sections. And then again, if you want to get our attention, you can raise your hand uh, if you open the participant window in your Zoom meeting window or press star nine on your phone. Uh, that'll raise your hand so we can, uh, you can get our attention. And we want to actually invite you all to take a quick moment to introduce yourselves in the chat. And so tell us, because we know we have people from actually all over the country and several other counties in California, um, take a moment just to share your name and the group or organization that you're with and what county and state you're from. I'll give you a moment just to share that in the chat so we have a sense of who's with us. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Najib. Lots of our Santa Cruz County partners. We have a pretty diverse audience here today in terms of the types of organizations. We have some of our guests from Cincinnati. So welcome everybody. I'm gonna let you keep scrolling through, introduce yourselves. And then meanwhile, I'm going to turn it over to David. Great, thank you, Nicole. All right, it's great to see right now 157 participants uh, in the participant count and uh, the chat is just streaming. David, I think you might be muted. Oh, uh, really? I unmuted myself. You can't yeah, hear I, me? I, I can I hear him. Hear you, David. Yeah, I can hear you. We can hear him. We can hear. I'm going to keep going. I think, Nicole, maybe you um, are muting primary or something. I don't know. Um, anyways, I was just saying that it's great to see all the chats coming in. Um, we're really excited to launch our ACES Network Learning Series with all of you and have the Center for Community Resilience and their partners in Cincinnati joining us today. Um, as you know, the topic of today's session, addressing the pair of ACES or adverse childhood experiences that are rooted in adverse community environments uh, aligns with First Five's vision uh, of healthy, happy, well-prepared children, thriving families, connected communities, and equitable systems. And while First Five's primary focus is young children, prenatal through age five and their families, we recognize that we must be connected to other partners, agencies, and systems uh, that support children and families across the lifespan uh, in order for all of us to ultimately be effective in, in supporting a healthy community. And Nicole, hopefully you can hear me now and we can move to the next slide. Um, so this is the only way that we can ever succeed at identifying and treating the effects of adverse childhood experiences, and more importantly, preventing them from occurring in the first place. Um, if the term adverse childhood experiences or ACEs is new to you, we're showing on this slide the 10 categories of ACEs that were identified in a study conducted by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and Kaiser Permanente back in 1998. Uh, this landmark study showed that ACEs, such as abuse, neglect, mental illness, and, and a family member that's incarcerated, family violence, substance abuse, and even divorce in the home, increase the risk for physical, social, emotional, and behavioral health problems throughout life. Uh, and in fact, the more ACEs has, ex the more ACEs someone has experienced in their life or in childhood, the higher the risk for disease and even early death. Next slide, please. 
So the good news is that in that time, since the original ACEs study, we've learned a lot, uh, a lot about how ACEs and toxic stress affect brain development, and also about effective strategies for identifying, treating, and preventing ACEs. Um, in fact, California recently launched the Statewide ACEs Aware Initiative uh, with a mission to change and save lives by helping providers understand the importance of screening for adverse childhood experiences and training providers to respond with trauma-informed care to mitigate the health impacts of toxic stress. Next slide, please. So the statewide ACEs Aware Initiative is led by our California's first ever Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, a champion in this field, uh, and her colleague, Dr. Karen Mark from the Department of Healthcare Services. In June of this year, ACEs Aware awarded 100 grants to organizations across California to help increase uh, and reach the impact, to help increase and reach the impact and impact um, of the initiative. So there are two ACEs Aware grantees active in Santa Cruz County. Um, one of the grantees is the Public Health Department uh, and the partners include uh, uh, folks that, uh, uh, joining us today, First Five, the Health Improvement Partnership and the Human Services Department. Uh, the other ACEs Aware grantee is in Santa Cruz County is Stanford Children's Health, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Uh, and since we have a very limited amount of time, I'm not going to go into more details about the ACEs activities of the other partners, but we will include some information about how to learn more about our coordinated efforts in a follow-up email uh, after today's session. Next slide, please. So First Five's role is to convene six network of care learning sessions to promote the ACEs Aware Initiative, share best practices and strengthen the coordination and collaboration amongst Medi-Cal provider community and other key partners serving children and families in Santa Cruz County. Our first three sessions will feature the Center for Community Resilience, starting with learning about the pair of ACEs in practice, followed by connecting across sectors and then connecting ACEs, equity and resilience. Um, We'll determine our next two topics based on feedback and themes that emerge from these three sessions. And then we'll end with a joint community conversation co-hosted with the Health Improvement Partnership. Our ultimate goal is to transform policies, practices, and systems in order to prevent adverse childhood experiences. And we know that work extends far beyond the current ACEs Aware grant, but it certainly is a great launching point. So as Nicole mentioned earlier, we're co-hosting these sessions with CORE Investments. CORE is a cross-sector collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being across the lifespan. And this partnership will help us integrate the ACEs learning sessions into other complementary efforts and initiatives in our county. So with all that said, I am now very pleased to introduce our featured guests from the Center of Com for Community Resilience. Dr. Wendy Ellis is an assistant professor in global health and the director of the Center for Community Resilience at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. The Center for Community Resilience seeks to improve the health of communities by enabling aligned policy, program and practices to address adverse childhood experiences in the context of adverse community environments, or as Dr. Ellis has coined it, the pair of ACEs. This innovative framing of ACEs with an explicit focus on equity and prevention has had a substantial influence on local initiatives, programs, public health initiatives, and local, state, and federal policy. Uh, using the pair of ACEs framing, building community resilience networks have successfully led systems and policy change focused on addressing longstanding economic, social, and health disparities by partnering with community, integrating service delivery, and building political will for change. Um, Wendy is joined by her colleague, Harrison Newton, who is the Deputy Director of the Center for Community Resilience. Uh, Harrison most recently served as the first Deputy Chief Resilience Officer in the nation's capital, co-leading a cross-sector citywide effort that culminated in the city's first resilience strategy. In that role, he coordinated five resilience-focused research teams spanning the city's health, housing, economy, technology, and emergency management services, assessing risks, and identifying opportunities for new transformative initiatives. Uh, Mr. Newton is also, has also led a broad visioning effort to identify priorities with leading philanthropies, 
businesses, nonprofits, and other stakeholders. Uh, he has served in many other government leadership roles and also led a coalition of nonprofits in Washington, DC. So we are just tremendously excited to have these two outstanding professionals join us today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy and Harrison who's gonna tell you more about their work. Well, yes, well, thank you, David. And certainly thank you, Nicole, for inviting us. And thank you to First Five Santa Cruz as well as Core Investments for you know, looking to really go upstream and lead this effort to help provide you with the tools and resources necessary to be most effective in preventing adversity, but really coming across multiple sectors to begin to address these things. So the first thing I wanna do is share my screen. Let's see if we can successfully do that. That's my first exercise in resilience right now. Um, so to talk, to begin to talk to you about the work that we do, and then we can kind of dive in. So, you know, you heard um, David talk about, you know, the, the preponderance of ACEs exposures and how that leads to a higher risk of, of negative outcomes later in life. And understanding that these outcomes can come from a number of different sources, it's important that we, we took a, a holistic approach in how we approach preventing adversity, fostering equity, fostering healing to get to resilience. And so at our center, we have the Building Community Resilience Networks, which will meet one of our original partners who started in this work over almost six years ago now, um, where we have these multi-sector coalitions that come together to really answer the essential question, what's driving adversity in our community? With community at our side to help to identify those things, and then through that cross-sector network, really begin to draw upon the multiple resources to go upstream and address the root causes of adversity. So from that work, we have developed a line of resources that really help to foster these conversations around equity, particularly racial inequity. And so these are learned lessons from our community engagement across the country. Um, different, going across different racial lines, economic lines, educational lines, but finding a means by which we can bring people to the table, hold this space to have these difficult conversations so that we're not just using our systems data, but we're also focused on the narrative. What is the lived experience of adversity, but also respecting the wisdom of our communities to help co-create these solutions. From this work, we've, from, from the building community resilience process, We've also begun to work with local health departments. In fact, we're very excited to announce that this week we invited Alameda County, California. So Oakland will be a part of our new Resilience Catalyst in Public Health, a work where we work with local health departments who are at the center acting as chief health strategists to really go upstream in, ad in addressing these longstanding inequities that drive oftentimes the adverse childhood experiences that we see. Of course, when we're talking about systems change, it's absolutely fundamental that we're considering what are the policies that are driving some of the inequities that intentionally are driving inequity by policy, but where are there also opportunities to leverage existing policy or rewrite policy so that we can have much more durable supports and buffers to help promote community level resilience. So this is the a map just to show you the network, the lessons learned from across the country. It's not a laboratory just in Washington, DC, but rather a living laboratory from across the country. And I'm very excited to be able to have our partners from Cincinnati who can tell you about their experience of incorporating ACEs in practice, ACEs awareness in practice, and what are the outcomes that are associated with that. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But first, I want to orient you to what is BCR the process? So we all have heard this idea of what is cross-sector collaboration and, and how does that, how do we go about doing that? And, and fundamentally, that is what is at the heart of the BCR process, not a model, meaning that this is something that is active, it's dynamic, and we're constantly moving through various cycles of creating a shared understanding, which is what we're gonna focus on mostly this afternoon, is creating a shared understanding of what does adversity look like in our community? What is the narrative of resilience? What is the community's uh, experience of adversity? But also, what does the community draw upon in order to bounce back 
And from our systems perspective, what's missing to help our community members prevent adversity, but also to bounce forward and thrive. So through this process, we begin to examine what is our state of readiness? And you'll begin to examine that in the exercise that we'll do in the breakout groups today, understanding what is our capacity? It's beyond screening for an ACE, but how will we respond? And who are our partners that are at the table that can help us have an effective and holistic response to what we learn from the adversities in our, in our client practice? Oftentimes when you go through this very systematic process, you recognize that Perhaps from a clinical perspective, the issues that, are, that we are trying to address and prevent have little to do with clinical care or social service. Oftentimes it may be exposures to community violence, it may be food insecurity, it may be housing instability. But out of that, you can hear there are multiple sectors of which that is absolutely their area of expertise and the issues of which they should address. And so that's how we begin to understand who are the cross-sector partners who should be at the table. But again, remembering, we do nothing without community voice. And so throughout this process, we have our community partners at the table, not only to inform the experience of adversity, but also to help us validate the models, the solutions that we create. And so it is this iterative process, this going through these cycles of which then we can truly come up with these solutions that will not only be embraced, but will endure. So you've heard us talk about the pair of ACEs. Let's begin to unpack that. Now, David explained the 10 classic ACEs, maternal depression, emotional and sexual abuse, substance abuse, domestic violence, physical and emotional neglect, divorce, mental illness, and incarceration, homelessness as well. Now, let us remember that the original ACEs study focused on a population that probably isn't necessarily representative of the populations of which we serve. So the understanding of adversity is really important that we listen, not just go down a checklist, but really listen to our patients and to our communities, to our clients. What is the experience of adversity? And like this tree will represents, these are things that oftentimes we can readily recognize, whether that's in, in an interaction in a clinical environment, if we're in a school and we can see a child who seems to be agitated and can't sit still. It's not just perhaps ADHD or some other behavioral disorder, but what's at the root of that? Did that child have to walk past a growing memorial for yet another drive-by shooting in the neighborhood? Did that child come to school hungry today and can't sit still because they're just absolutely famished? Did that child have to endure yet another evening where mom or dad wasn't at home, not because they didn't want to be, but because they had to work yet another third shift just to keep a roof over the heads? You see, those are the root causes. Those are the things that we don't readily assess through a checklist, but we can through dialogue through listening, through partners, begin to understand the root causes of adversity in our communities, adverse community environments. So understanding the effects of poverty as an adversity itself, discrimination, community disruption, the lack of opportunity, the lack of access to economic mobility, the lack of social capital to be able to advocate effectively for your community's needs. These things are at the root of many of the adversities that we measure and that we can diagnose through a checklist. But we can't necessarily treat them simply by applying social services or some other clinical intervention. Look in those roots, you'll see housing, you'll see public safety, you'll see economic development, you'll see other sectors that must be at the table if we are to create a richer soil to have a much, much more vibrant tree. If we are to create and put in place the supports and buffers that our communities need to both treat, but most importantly, prevent the experience of adversity in the first place. And so the parabasis framing gets us to thinking about outcomes, but those outcomes in the context of both our policies as drivers and our practice, our opportunity for practice change 
to really address root causes. Now, this is a data sheet that we created for our partners in San Jose. It does have Santa Clara County um, on here, but we'll make sure that we get one for, for Santa Cruz as well. But it's, it's a way of, of creating the understanding of the, days, the, the ACEs, the data behind this. Understanding that ACEs don't occur in isolation. And oftentimes in these households, the adversities pile up, whether that is the adversities that's due to economic hardship, not just poverty as a measure, but thinking about it, as I described earlier, you know, are our families paying more than one third of their, their income on housing? If so, that means there's less money available for things like a healthy, nutritious meal, or perhaps a tutor after school, or some other after school activity that would help our children thrive and grow. And in the community environment, what are the resources that we have invested in that provide those strong, deep roots in the soil to help support a sturdy tree? What are those things that, that take away from the health and well being of our communities? The rates of violence, access to medical care. Those are the things that we have to think about as adversities and equities in our communities that pile up and if not contribute to the adversities that we see on the branches and the leaves, certainly exacerbate the experience of them. So of course this year we have been particularly challenged when we talk about the pair of ACEs that go beyond just these individual outcomes that are on the branches and the leaf, but are absolutely felt at the community level. Service workers who have been forced to continue to report to work without the access to PPE to keep themselves protected. The inordinate amount of burden of COVID-19 deaths in our communities of color heaped upon an environment of where we've had an, a pronounced experience and exposure to social unrest due to police brutality. Where our inequities with regard to income and wealth that's available within families has only become more pronounced as our, our employment lines have grown and our economy has shuttered. For families who are trying to balance some means of an income while also teaching their children at home. Oftentimes where the digital gap has become just so pronounced so painful, where we see children that were already behind the curve now being left behind even further because of the learning gap. This is the pair of ACEs in 2020. But what it has made very clear for all of us is that the root cause of all of these structural inequities really come back to structural racism, come back to our policies that were intentionally written to hold back communities of color are now having this widespread effect across all of our communities. This is the work that's in front of us. If you are to address adversity, prevent ACEs, we all have to understand the sources. And we have to work across multiple sectors in order to address this. That's what equity has to do with this work connecting our systems and our policies to these community characteristics and then to the population health outcomes that we screen for and we attempt to treat in practice. That is the connection between trauma, equity, and resilience. Understanding that oftentimes the traumas that we see at the community level, at the individual level, are a result of systemic inequity and that if we are to get to resilience, we have to foster equity. We have to build the supports that actually help individuals bounce forward and thrive. That's the challenge that's in front of all of us as we become much more aware of adversity and understanding the cycles of adversity and the systems that help to produce many of these adversities and inequities that we see in community whether that's in housing, whether that's inequity within public education, and certainly some of the practices that we've seen in law enforcement and criminal justice. They feed upon each other. And so part of our charge is not just how we change practice and how we treat individuals, whether that's again in social service or in clinical environments, but it's also thinking about the environment, the context in which those services are provided. 
and making sure that we're not just patching people up and sending them further into these vicious cycles, but that we're a part of a cross-sector coalition that is intent on breaking these vicious cycles. That is the power of collaboration. That is how we use the building community resilience process to address, create a shared understanding of structural inequity to when we assess our state of readiness to identify specific policy and program gaps so that we can get to addressing implicit bias. So that our cross-sector partners together, we are creating equitable access to those supports and buffers that are needed in our communities. And that we are focused in holding each other accountable for process, program, and policy change. And with the community at our side, we are both prioritizing the issues to be addressed, but also co-creating them as well. That's how we and our network partners apply the BCR process and the values that are central to truly addressing adversity, preventing adversity. That is the real power of collaboration. So it is my honor to turn this over to my colleague, Harrison Newton, who can introduce you to our Cincinnati partners and share with you their experience of putting a pair of ACEs in practice. Thank you, Wendy. And so uh, it, it really is my honor to uh, introduce you to one of our longstanding partners, Joining Forces for Children uh, in Cincinnati. And, you know, really, uh, you know, I, I think I would introduce them as a collective of educators and healthcare professionals, uh, community members uh, who really work together to reverse the effects of childhood trauma, um, the ACEs, uh, with the goal of brightening the future for children, uh, their families, <laughs> communities. And today, really, we're going to talk about Parent Connects, a partnership between two of the key organizations in Joining Forces. Uh, that has really just been transformative in terms of addressing the ACEs directly and putting, uh, you know, what, what begins as theory into actual practice, which is really what, you know, the Center for Community Resilience is all about. So um, at this point, I'm going to, oh, great, it's on the screen. I'm going to turn it over uh, to our team from Joining Forces, and I know that they will be introducing themselves as part of their presentation. So uh, beginning, I think, with uh, Dr. Shapiro, Bob Shapiro. Yeah, thanks, Harrison, uh, very much for that introdu introduction. My name's Bob Shapiro. I'm a pediatrician at Cincinnati Children's. My clinical work for many years has been in the field of child abuse and neglect. And uh, I've had my uh, more than my share of taking care of and seeing kids who are victims of maltreatment and really through my partnership with BCR and uh, Dr. Ellis, uh, have been very excited to help take our work upstream. You know, we, are, uh, we, we really began this work to try and prevent poor outcomes, uh, not only the outcomes of child abuse and neglect, but all the many outcomes that exposure to adversity and experiencing toxic stress uh, lend um, and are part of producing. Today with me presenting are a, a colleague of mine, Dr. Chris Bowling, um, who has uh, been working in a practice uh, and who has implemented this uh, Parent Connect intervention that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, Jill Hoon, who is the VP of the Parent Connects program and our partner at Beach Acres Parenting Center and Emily Eisman, who works with me at the Marison Center at Cincinnati Children, who's been very much responsible for helping organize data collection, um, feedback to the practices, uh, and uh, helping to organize this uh, within our division uh, at Cincinnati Children's. Uh, Jill, next slide. So I'm not gonna spend time telling you about ACEs. Uh, David Brody did a great job introducing them in the beginning. This is just a screenshot I pulled off of from the CDC website. Um, the CDC has got a lot of resources about adverse childhood experiences. I do wanna just point out the vital signs that they uh, list here. And, and these are just a small number of the um, health outcomes that the CDC talks about. 
One in six adults experienced four or more types of ACEs. Five of 10 of the leading causes of death are associated with ACEs. And by preventing ACEs, they estimate that we could reduce the number of adults with a diagnosis of depression by as much as 44%. These are, um, we recognize that ACEs are really a scourge. We recognize that if we can change the outcome for a large population of children as well as individuals by addressing ACEs, as pediatricians, we could have a huge impact. But the question is, how do we do that exactly? The next slide. So, furthermore, on the CDC website, they talk about the six methods, these six steps, these six interventions, that if we were able to attend to these, we could have an impact on addressing how our bodies, how our biologic response to ACEs occurs. Strengthen economic support for families, promote social norms that protect against violence and adversity, ensure a strong start for children, teach skills, connect youth with caring adults and activities, and intervene to lessen immediate and long-term harms. In Cincinnati, we have a, a collective impact initiative called Joining Forces for Children. And our aim is to educate the community about ACEs and resilience and how we can collectively change our systems, which includes addressing equity and justice uh, to improve outcomes. So on the next slide, I just wanna highlight that the program that we're now gonna talk about is called Parent Connects. And although it does lots of things, I'm calling out these three highlighted um, um, benefits of Parent Connects and how we are addressing adversity and improving resilience within the child and within the family. We are uh, providing family-centered solutions to reduce stress and to help keep families together. We keep families together, we reduce not only the stress, but we also probably contribute to economic prosperity, holding down a job. Uh, we, to ensure a strong start for children, the, the crux, the heart of our program is parent coaching. And in teaching skills, we teach parenting skills and how to improve relationships within family. So um, those are the principles that we have, and I'm gonna turn this over now to my colleague, Dr. Bowling. Hi, I'm Chris Bowling, and actually um, the partner for us, I'm a pe general pediatrician first and foremost. I also do a lot of work in pediatric obesity. And for those of you, you know, who know the history of ACEs, uh, there is a strong history in work with patients with obesity where it was first described um, from, the, from the very early studies. Um, I also was a board member at uh, Beach Acres, which is a parenting center here in Cincinnati. And as a board member there, uh, we started talking about ACEs. And with my background as a general pediatrician, my background as, in obesity medicine, it became sort of an interesting collision for me um, to be sort of a, to become sort of our practice champion about um, how do we address ACEs in a busy pediatric office. Well, for those of you who are providers, you know, we, we are inundated with a lot of things that we're supposed to be charged with doing in a, in a pediatric visit. Um, and in some places, as I understand, you're actually mandated to do screening for ACEs. Um, I would venture to say that a lot of people have like hesitance about yet, yet another mandate. Um, but I'm here to tell you that um, this is one that pays big dividends. Um, it's something that really for our practice has been pretty transformative and something that I think my partners um, have come to really embrace as, as, as part of their role as someone promoting health. Um, for those of you who do screening, you know, it's the, 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 there are a lot of uh, comments about, you know, like, well, I, I already look for these things. Do I really need to screen for them? Well, we really know, you know, certainly from a developmental perspective, that we need to do something more concrete than just be alert to things, that we really pick up a lot more things by actually screening rather than just being alert. We actually have to do some concrete things, and that's what we started doing. So if we go to our next slide. I, I'm here to tell you it is doable. Um, over the long haul, the way you structure it, we used, it's, it's Bob and Jill, who you're going to hear from and Emily in just a moment, 
um, we, you, we really struggled with how do you do this? How do you um, uh, find a tool that works for you in a busy, busy pediatric office? Um, we started off with one tool and then we adapted it and we changed it. Um, we had our, our nursing staff and our MAs administer some of it. We looked at doing some of it online. Um, we've done a lot of different things to incorporate it into our, um, uh, into our workflow. And um, it's, it's very doable. We managed to uh, uh, come away from it going that this, thinking that this is a, a, a strong way of sort of kicking off the discussion with families. Um, and you really wind up picking up more than you would expect otherwise. Um, it's important to make it your own when you can, uh, where, because they're gonna be, what we find with screens is that um, uh, it, the more you can make it uh, fit your own workflow and your own patients, the better. Now, obviously there are you know, very specific questions that need to be handled for it to be meaningful, um, but uh, the screen does have room we, we, at least we made our screen where it was, uh, at least in the way we delivered it, um, very much fit our office flow. Um, so once you've done the screening, what do you do next? Um, there are a lot of things that you do next. Um, I got into this project, you know, being in, being in obesity medicine, I do a lot of training with motivational interviewing and affecting behavior change. Um, and Bob and Jill approached me about this project saying like, we'd like to use motivational interviewing for this. I'm like, okay, so what exactly is the behavior change that you need to use motivational interviewing for doing um, ACEs screening? Um, it took me a little while to wrap my head around it, but it, it's a really wonderful application for motivational interviewing because you're trying to get uh, parents to um, become accepting of things that they really are wanting help with. Um, so even a little bit of basic motivational interviewing that we helped uh, train our, our pediatricians and providers with um, went a long way in helping them create um, space to talk, to have some fairly difficult co uh, conversations with parents. We're talking about things, you know, when you're talking about ACEs, we're talking about things that are very personal, things that are very much associated with being a good parent. And it's hard for parents to say, I need help with parenting. Um, there is something about them feeling like they're, they're, they're failing. And so I, we find that some of the uh, motivational interviewing skills that we have are able to take it away from that judgmental zone and allow people to become more accepting of assistance. Um, when they're when they're ready for it, um, and we're not talking about big. You know, I do motivational interviewing uh, when we're talking about some bigger behavior uh, changes. You know, it, it came from the world of substance abuse. We're not talking about anything that big. We're talking about being willing to talk with someone, being willing to accept help about a food bank, being willing to uh, seek help if they're in an abusive relationship being willing to seek mental health resources. So we're talking about things that are big in the long run, but are things that may not be quite as a heavy lift as some other behavior change items might be. Um, one of the things that really drew us to Parent Connects um, was the ability of the here and now. Uh, we find, you know, that there are a lot of things in pediatrics. If you have, if you throw up barriers, obviously, for people to access services, be those mental health services, be those dietitian services, be those um, all sorts of sorts of issues. The more you can ease that transition, the more you can make that a warm handoff to someone in your office, the more likely you are to get things accomplished. So one of the things that we loved about having uh, Parent Connects in our office was it gave us immediate uh, access to a parenting specialist, uh, someone who actually became part of our, you know, it became part of our office staff, um, really was a, uh, just became one of us. Um, she was there with our staff. She was there with our parents. Um, she did things on our website. She did some in person. She does some things over the phone. She does things via telehealth. Um, just someone who became really part of our office was really a wonderful, um, a wonderful piece for us. 
Um, the key benefits to care of having this parenting support in our office, it, we felt like it really made a difference for our patients and families. These were really concrete changes. Um, a lot of our patients, you know, are in that two to three year old range um, who become real behavioral challenges for families. Um, it would made a real makes a real difference with some of the biggest behavior cha behavior challenges of pediatrics. Um, it really gave our families a signal that everything is fair game to address with us. You know, while sometimes we, um, yeah, pediatricians are a pretty good hearted bunch and we're there to help our, our patients. And, you know, sometimes they just, parents just don't think to even ask their pediatrician about certain issues that we might be able to really assist them with. Um, it also manages to make our entire office aware to these kinds of issues. You know, it puts, a, puts it in front of our, our, our nurse advisory staff and, and other team members. This is an area that we as a practice are, find important. Um, and it allows us too to really use those various aspects of our team that, um, that are helpful. Like we really found that our lactation consultant um, really was able to um, begin to understand how ACEs were affecting um, the issues that she addressed with parents. Even our scheduler became aware of ACEs and became got to a point where she was like, I need to be able to refer directly to our parent specialist because this mom who is scheduling a, a, a checkup with a newborn, um, it really needs help. So it really became a team approach being able to refer to our parenting specialist. It really honed your skills as a toned our skills as providers in talking with these issues, both about ACEs and also the more we use motivational interviewing and non-threatening, non-judgmental language, the better we get at it. Um, and it really allows, you know, it really allows the provider an opportunity to 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 provide some effective help for people. Just some other random observations before I turn this over to Jill to tell you a little bit more about the ins and outs of Parent Connects. Um, our one, to, one year to four year old uh, families, when they have one and four to four year olds, really are high utilizers of our program. So our screens came back positive a lot more than we expected. Our office, we're in the Kentucky suburbs. Um, of Cincinnati. And for those of you, I, I know there's some folks who do know Cincinnati. It's kind of an interesting area. We have both urban poor, we have rural poor, we have lots of suburban families, um, but, and a really predominance of suburban families. And, you know, just like you would expect in a lot of uh, places, there's more ACEs out there than you expect. Um, this was a new concept for our families, and they really became accustomed to uh, to having a parenting specialist in our office. It does take your time for your staff to figure out what's going on and how this parenting specialist and these other supports work into the office. It takes even longer for your provider colleagues. Um, uh, Jill, who, who, who did our, our metrics on this, really showed I was the original, um, uh, the primary referrer at first and then very quickly Oh, I shouldn't say very quickly. It actually took a little while for my other providers to, to start um, outpacing me on number of referrals. Um, it takes even longer for administrators and funders to figure it out. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jill. Hi everyone, um, and thank you for letting us share. Um, as you can see, this has been a complete team approach. Um, you're seeing four team members, we have many more who have worked on this project over the past few years, um, and you're gonna hear from Emily next. But I just wanted to kind of talk through the flow on how this works, because you're hearing a lot of reason we do it, why we do it, why it's good. Um, but really, we try to break this down into three steps to make it understandable. The first step is the questionnaire. And um, Chris mentioned, we went through a few iterations of a questionnaire. We started with the standardized one, and then we became aware very quickly that we wanted one that was more sensitive to look at not only specific ACEs, but also parental stress, um, uh, parental stress that may lead to toxic stress and um, some other needs that families may have um, that definitely um, connect with ACEs. So it's a 17 question, que 17 question um, tool that is used typically at well child visits. And we ask all of our partner practices to do this at at least three or four well child visits before the age of six. And part of that is because Chris mentioned one to four is the high utilize, utilizer. And we also know that early childhood and early intervention with parenting makes such a difference. And so, um, so that's how the screening works. We also give data back to the practices. So Chris mentioned they learned a lot. 
when we collect this data, we use it. Um, it also indicates some referrals for our services, but we also give the data back to say, this is what your population is shaking out to look like. And here are the kind of needs and responses we're getting so that you can definitely be attuned to that as you move forward. Um, the second key component, which is a very important component, is those parenting specialists who are dedicated to be of the office, not just in the office. And so Chris spoke to that. We, um, we know of services that have been in places where the person is not necessarily part of the team. And we have been intentional about being part of the care team at the practices, working closely with all of the staff, from schedulers to the pediatricians themselves, and really trying to um, help promote care and promote health and coordinating um, with pediatricians around what's going on in that family, what's going on with that parent, so they have a more holistic view of that child's health. Um, we meet with families today, all virtual. Um, we are not an essential worker in healthcare, and so healthcare asks us to stay away. <laughs> um, we do stop in and, and check in, but we are not working at the site right now, which is true. If anything's positive about 2020, it has been that going virtual for us has led to very low no-show or cancellation rates. And it's also led to the ability to see into people's homes, which has given us a wonderful opportunity to do even richer parent coaching if that was possible. Um, our parenting specialists are typically people who have at least five to seven years of experience working with families and understand um, the way to coach not to treat, because this is not a mental health service. This is really what Chris talked about, founded in motivational interviewing type techniques. And so we want to make sure that people um, that are coming into this role are non-judgmental, but also really staying in the lane of prevention and intervention that is swift, brief, and solution focused. Um, last but not least, we meet with families when they're available. Um, we typically meet with each family about three to six sessions. Those sessions vary from about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and what has come out of this is we have proven some pretty cool results, which Emily's going to talk about. But our model has also been um, designated as evidence-based by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, so we're really excited about the work we're doing. And we know with the standardization we've done of the intervention that it has led to consistent positive results, which we're really excited about. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Emily so she can talk about all the goodness with the outcomes. Thank you, Jill. Um, yeah, so I'm going to share a little bit about um, the different perspectives on the program that we had. So perspectives of pediatricians and the practice, pediatric practices that participated, the perspectives of the parents, and then some of the outcomes that we've gotten. So first, one of the benefits um, to pediatricians of participating in this program is that um, doing these efforts helps them to meet some of the standards um, for recognition as a patient-centered medical home. So um, we engage, we're um, working with 11 practices over the course of this, and many of them are patient-centered medical homes, and this helps them to meet that recognition. It also allows them for, to participate in quality improvement efforts um, and to obtain MOC Part 4 credits. So we worked with them to track how they're doing over time and to work on um, trying out different interventions um, to make that screening and the intervention process just tighter and better and more effective. Um, so it helped the pediatricians to receive those MOC Part 4 credits. So if you guys are interested in doing something like that, keep that in mind for your own practices if you're a pediatrician. Um, so in terms of screening, we've in three years across the 11 practices, we've screened over 18,000 uh, families. Um, and those have been reviewed, the completed screens have been reviewed by 96% of them have been reviewed by pediatricians, um, and 26% of those screens came back positive for concern, so about one in four of the screens. And a lot of our practices are, um, serve more suburban families, um, so I think there was a surprise that there was as much need um, coming up with the, the families as they got. And so you can see the highest um, was uh, parental stress, parenting stress concerns that were things that people were disclosing most often, um, followed by depression and then financial and food insecurity and then harsh punishment. And then I will say that once um, 
And a lot of these cases with the parenting stress is that would be the initial concern that they would disclose. And then they would meet with the parenting specialist and very often other concerns would come up then once they felt more comfortable with that parenting specialist. So asking about parenting stress was in some ways a foot into the door to a deeper conversation. Um, next slide. Um, in terms of parenting, parent coaching, um, there were 3,764 families that were referred to the parenting specialist over the three years and nearly 2,000 families um, took us up on that and participated in parent coaching. And so about 52% of the referred families participated and that's better than most group-based uh, parenting interventions that have been done with pediatric practices. So we're getting a little better uptake or uptake of our services. Um, and we did um, over 4,000 parent coaching sessions over the three year period. In terms of pediatricians, so we surveyed um, the pediatricians that participated in the program and we asked them, how likely are you to recommend this service to a colleague um, on a scale from zero, not at all, to 10, extremely? And the pediatricians gave an average rating of a 9.4. So they were very likely to recommend this program. And all of them gave either an eight to a 10 rating on that question. Next slide. Um, 100% all of these pediatricians agreed or strongly agreed that they were satisfied with Parent Connect and that it improved the quality of their patient care, their ability to address parenting concerns, and that the parenting specialist was a valuable addition to their healthcare team and was effective at addressing the family's needs. And three out of the four pediatricians agreed or strongly agreed that Parent Connect helped them to do their job better and Im improve their relationships with their families. Next slide. Um, and then we looked at, we had asked the pediatricians also about how supported they felt in addressing both parenting concerns as well as family psychosocial concerns. Um, so that would be like depression, talking about uh, financial insecurity, food insecurity, domestic violence, substance use. That would be what we're considering the family psychosocial concerns. So they asked about that and before Parent Connect to one year after implementing Parent Connect, you can see that there was a significant improvement in how supported the pediatricians felt um, in addressing these concerns, how much confidence they felt they had in addressing them and how much knowledge of available resources they had. So significant increases over time with implementing Parent Connect. So it improved their skills. Then we also asked parents what they thought of the program. Um, and we asked the same question, how likely are you to recommend parent coaching to a friend or other parent on a scale from zero, not at all, to 10 extremely? And you'll see that parents gave an average rating of a 9.3, which is really good. Um, they were really, really happy with the program. 71% gave a rating of a 10 that they would be extremely likely to recommend it. So this is service that the parents were really grateful that they had access to, that they were able to meet one-on-one -on -one with these parenting specialists and get additional supports in their life. Next slide. And so we looked at change over time, specifically in the group of parents that met with the parenting specialists. And what we saw is we saw significant improvements in their parent and child interactions over the course of participating or in parent coaching. Um, we saw significant improvements in their parenting efficacy and in their parenting satisf satisfaction over time. And then the question is, how does this impact their risk and adversity? And so what we saw also was that there was a significant decrease um, and the percentage of parents that were reporting risk factors after engaging in parent coaching. And so you can see at the beginning of, um, at their first session of parent coaching, 83% of the parents were disclosing some kind of risk factor. And then further on, either at the third session or at follow-up, um, only 57% were reporting some kind of concern or risk factor. So that's a reduction of 26% of families were no longer reporting any risk factors. And so there was a significant reduction across their total risk factors, their parenting stress, stress their depression, uh, food and financial insecurity and harsh punishment all went down over the course of participating in parent coaching. So that was very encouraging for us to see. 
Um, if you're interested in finding out more about Parent Connect as a program, you can check out the Beach Acres Parenting Center uh, website, which the link is right there. We also have a couple of, we have an editorial um, in the journal Health Affairs um, that you can check out. And we also have an article in the Journal of Pediatric Healthcare that you can take a look at. And like Jill spoke of before, we just recently um, received evidence-based practice status by the Centers for Disease Control related to this program. So very exciting. And Bob, I'm gonna pass it to you. So just to finish up, you know, for me, one of the truly exciting things about doing this project has been incorporating a community partner within a pediatric practice. And I know that on this call, there are lots of community partners as well. And we've talked for years about how to better integrate what we do in the practice and in the office with community resources. So this is an example that we implemented. It was an experiment. Uh, we found that the outcomes uh, were pretty good. We're in the midst, and, and uh, Emily assures me we're almost ready to know what the outcomes are of healthcare utilization following Parent Connect. And we're looking at such things as ED visits and hospital admissions, uh, compliance with well child visits, immunization rates, uh, being present for acute illness. And um, th this, the um, Project design is a complex one. It's a, for those of you scientists, it's a stepped wedge cluster randomized controlled trial. And um, we're really very, um, uh, we look very much forward to finding out if we've managed to have a positive health impact on our, the children in these practices as well. Some of the next steps we recognize that will be important is to see if we can scale and spread this program. So we'll be looking for other practices to uh, implement Parent Connects and conduct um, a study on their experience. Uh, we're finding that, as Jill mentioned, telemedicine has been really good for Parent Connects because we, it's been an easy way to reach with parents and to see into their home to have, get a better idea of exactly what they're experiencing and how they can be helped. And the other thing that we are interested in learning more about is the efficacy of the program in low-income families. Um, they, as um, I think Emily or Chris mentioned, many of the practices who have been involved in the study are suburban practices that have a uh, Medicaid population that probably hovers around 15, 20%. And so we don't know yet how well the program works in those practices with a heavier Medicaid population. Is there another slide? That's it. And so I, we're going to be sticking around uh, in these breakout sessions, not knowing if you're going to have any questions for us or not, but we'll be available to answer more questions uh, if, if they come up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much from uh, the Joining Forces team. That was uh, extraordinary. Um, I think now I am going to ask a few questions, and we have a lot of questions from uh, everyone who's on the call, uh, and my colleague, uh, Dr. Ellis, will help me field some of those as well. Uh, so I think I'll just begin with, with some, some very basic questions, and uh, we'll try to have a good conversation. Nicole, does that sound good? Yes. Okay, great. And also, Harrison, just to let you know, um, we'll want to check, too, if any of the participants on the Spanish language channel want to ask any questions. So we'll help field those as well. Thank you. So, you know, I think maybe it'd be great uh, to go all the way back in time and think about, uh, you know, joining forces as you were getting started. Because I think there's a lot of questions about like, well, how are you doing what you do now? But also, how did you get started? Uh, what were the barriers to, you know, creating this, uh, you know, collaboration between, you know, community-based organizations and healthcare, <laughs> uh, which some have observed, uh, you know, that can be a difficult uh, bridge to cross. Uh, what were some of the barriers you, you ran up against and how did you overcome them? Well, Harrison, we started this initiative not as a healthcare initiative, but as a community wide initiative that included healthcare. Um, and so we're divided into a couple of different groups. We have a group of people and community members who are working within an early childhood channel. We have a similar group working with school-age children and school-age after-school programs. 
we have a healthcare channel, and we have a community connections channel. And uh, that's just the way we ended up getting organized. We recognized that if we were going to tackle this issue of toxic stress and build resilience within our community, the application probably looks different depending on where it's being applied. And you're uh, alluding to the fact that healthcare is a tough nut to crack. It is indeed. Um, and this is why we're so excited to look for things like um, data to help support the initiatives. But truly um, what's going on, I think in California with your ACEs initiative and screening, you're very much pioneering change, figuring out how to incorporate this within your practice. How do you add, as Chris talked about, just a, another screening tool? How do you respond to positive screens? Are you opening up Pandora's box and you won't know how to respond to the horrible things that you're gonna hear? These are valid concerns. And, um, and so we have found that um, there's strength in working together. And in this kind of initiative, not assuming that healthcare and healthcare providers need to have all the answers, but that we can be uh, part of finding a solution together with our community organizations. You know, Jill could probably speak to this a little bit too. I apologize, I've somehow lost my video, but um, we started off too with a lot of personal connections. You know, I, I, I got involved in it because um, I knew the work that Beach Acres did and I felt like it was just a, a good thing to try. And you get a few people who, who become champions for it. Jill also did a great job of getting one of our um, local funders who is connected with a hospital system with a, a group called TriHealth that really opened up a lot of healthcare offices to us. Um, but it was through those previous connections that you, you, know, you get a few true believers and then you start um, expanding out. A lot, so a lot of it is personal, a lot of it is connections and just getting, getting some people who, you get, need a few people who get it and then you get the, the, the the, the next person who joins in. Emily, there's a question here that perhaps I'm gonna to punt to you. Someone's asked for about the demographic makeup of patients' families that were being served. Can you share that off the top of your head? Not entirely off the top <laughs> of my head, but I think Sorry. like, I think, you, you alluded to it when you were talking about the percent Medicaid. So most of our practices are about, what, 15 to 20% Medicaid practices. Um, and so I think like the average uh, family has an income of $75,000 a year. Like these are, I believe, Jill, do you, can you pull off any more specific details? Yeah, so um, on average, about 15% of the population we're serving has Medicaid. The Medicaid does not necessarily mean that they're living in poverty or, or living below the poverty line. Um, it could mean other things. But in serving families, most of the families we're serving are white, um, are living in suburban areas, are working and potentially with two heads of household. Although that's not our total mix, that probably is the majority of the folks we're serving. Um, we have also started a partnership with a federally qualified health center in Cincinnati that looks very different. And um, what we're finding there is parent coaching is still effective, but we're also needing to do some wraparound supports for those families. So the coaches we hire, the parenting specialists we hire for that work can do more resource navigation in addition to the parent coaching. So, um, so we're building that. Like Bob said, we aren't there yet, but we really are looking into this being relevant. We believe that the parenting support is relevant for all parents, um, but the way that we approach it and the way that we work with practices looks different. Because even though we are in 11 or 14, we're in 14 practices now, every practice has its own personality, own workflow, own process, own way. Uh, so it's quite an interesting process to kind of see. We're all there for healthcare, but it's all very different. <laughs> so that's been one of the, the fun exploration ac activities that we've done with all our friends at the practices. So I want to help Harrison out with a question there um, because this, you know, we started at the question of how this began, but there's a question on the board about really where this work goes for long-term systems change. And that is, does Parents Connect link parents to policy and advocacy or slash systems change opportunities 
in addition to their own clinical experiences? Um, if so, can you share some highlights from that? And I know that you all have been involved in directly in policy and advocacy work, both at the federal level, but also locally and state as well that might be helpful to share. So I'm just gonna start with the Parent Connects level and I'm gonna to punt to Bob who will talk about more of the system policy because there is a connection. Um, with regard to our program, we definitely see that need. And so at the community level and at the individual level, we are supporting parents and advocating for their children and advocating for their children's needs. Um, many parents don't know they can do that or know how to do that. So we're really, um, we go there with parents. You know, kids are getting kicked out of school. Kids are having issues getting the health care getting the support they need. Um, we, you know, parents are their best advocates. So we're really coaching parents in that lane for sure. Um, but I'm going to have Bob talk about how this connects to the bigger um, level with the Joining Forces project. So Parent Connects is an example of boots on the ground, working with families, helping pediatricians and medical practices, pediatric practices be more effective in the work that they do to create better outcomes for the families and children that they serve. And we need those programs. We need to figure out when you're face-to-face -face with the family, how do you change the outcome? On a broader scale, we, we look at what BCR is doing and the effects of the paravasis and how racism and poverty and community violence, not just home violence, are all aces and all have detrimental effects on all of us as a community. And so, we aren't going to fix the problem through Parent Connects. Parent Connects is a good way for us to intervene as providers, but we also need to be active cheerleaders to really spread the message that adversity and toxic stress is a public health crisis and that by addressing it systemically, we can change more than just the outcomes for the individuals within our practice. And, and so th this is our, one of our strongest partnerships with BCR, and it's really slow work, it's really frustrating, but um, uh, we need to all be strong voices to um, carry this message to our community and to our legislators. And one of the other things that we're doing with Parent Connect, I'm sorry, with Joining Forces, is to build a movement within the greater Cincinnati area. And to do that, we need to help in, engage communities, uh, parents, citizens, recognizing that this is a public health crisis, that we can all have a role in changing the outcomes for kids. Amazing. You know, and so maybe now I, I see a, a slew of questions that are really about, uh, you know, the, the, some of the tactics around how, how you do the work. Um, you know, but I, I think maybe one stream of them is around resources um, and even a little bit more about what motivational interviewing uh, is um, and, ha and how you do it particularly. So maybe, maybe the way to approach it is if I were an organization that wanted to move it down this path um, to understanding what motivational inter interviewing is and, and, you know, what resources I might want to tap into, what would your suggestions be? Um, thanks for asking that, Harrison. I just sent a message to Wendy. I was noticing the very same number of questions. So what we did with our pediatrician, so I'm a pediatrician and I do, you know, a motivational interview training for pediatricians to do weight management stuff. Uh, what we did for this, um, we didn't go into a huge amount of detail. We, we trained, for those of you who know about motivational interviewing, it really is based in a number of uh, very specific skills. It's about op asking open questions. They're about um, doing what, using what are called reflective statements, using a couple of tools, one called an illicit provide illicit, another one called a readiness ruler. Um, they're very specific tools uh, that really attend to uh, a client patient language. Um, so it's, you can get some pretty basic training in it pretty easily from a couple of different sources. If you go to motivationalinterviewing.org, you'll find um, some trainers who are in the area. What we went into it with was we were not gonna try to teach everybody everything about motivational interviewing. We weren't gonna worry about people getting certified in it when they left, but we wanted to get people the gist of what motivational interviewing was in terms of a non-judgmental communication style. So we went into it wanting to teach them 
a few basic skills so they would be able to not uh, be off-putting when they had some difficult conversations with families. We basically did, um, uh, a couple of the parenting specialists and I, I, actually one in particular, Sue, and I would do um, uh, a training that was usually like a two and a half hour, two, two and a half hour training session um, with pediatricians in the evening and, and, and get them up to speed. Um, and then, you know, really went into it saying like, you're not going to just use this for Parent Connects. You're going to be using this, hopefully, in a lot of different aspects of your practice. So that there was a little bit more of a value add than just one, one, one program. We'd be happy to share those. I'd be happy to share the slides and the trainings that we did with them as well. Excellent. And now I know we're kind of coming to the end of our, our time here together uh, on, on this segment of, of the agenda. Uh, but the great thing is that, uh, you know, there was definitely a huge connection made to systems change, which is really, I think, at the core of where we're going to, to move next. Um, so again, can't appreciate enough, uh, you know, the, the, great, the great work that you've been able to share with us today and your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, it really was uh, excellent. Um, and so now I will turn it over to Dr. Ellis to take us into the next part of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for the lively conversation and certainly, you know, really grateful to our partners in Cincinnati Joining Forces for Children, the Cincinnati Children's Hospital, as well as Beach Acres for all the work that they do every day to address adversity and certainly to be champions for resilience and equity in Cincinnati. And so moving on to the next part of this, we are going to, before we do the breakouts, I kind of want to give you a level set because we keep using these words, right? And, you know, we use equity, we use equality, we use adversity. And I think it's really important for us to really understand what do we mean when we talk about resilience? Um, how do we measure it? How will we know that, that it's in place? And so in B BCR, Building Community Resilience, we are using, you know, the foundational science of resilience that was first put in place into the literature pretty firmly by Anne Maston. So her work on understanding what were those factors that predicted how well a child would bounce back after being exposed to adversity. And then zooming out a bit to extrapolate if, the, if, if a child uh, ability to bounce back after being exposed to uh, abuse or neglect, you know, could be predicted by their coping skills and their, their life satisfaction and self-efficacy skills, that that had to be nurtured by family level resilience factors, right? So resources and supportive relationships and the par parents' relationship with one another, but also how parents are supported, whether they have access to stable caregiving and spousal support, stable employment, ways to, to stabilize the household. So when you start to look at those first two fact, first two columns there, you begin to understand like, well, this is an ecosystem, right? It's not that the family, the child exists in isolation of the family or the family exists in isolation of the community. So when we talk about community resilience, we're recognizing that in order to get to that individual level uh, resilience, there have to be a whole another layer of supports and buffers that actually provide the means by which a parent has to, to, to have stable employment, to be a stable caregiver for their child. Because we know, as the science indicates, that one of the biggest predictors for a child to bounce back after being exposed to adversity is access to one stable adult. And so we as a community have to think about how are we supporting our families, our adults, so that they can then support our children, both in a prevention standpoint, but also from a, a bounce back standpoint. And so we focus very much so on those community level factors. That's why, you know, earlier I had the, the understanding of how housing and public education and law enforcement and criminal justice create this community uh, either of resilience or it, it detracts from resilience and creates this vicious cycle of adversity. So these are the things when we talk about resilience, we want to get really precise in, in thinking about what are those variables that oftentimes in our literature, in our practice, we recognize as those supportive buffers that help individuals bounce back. So what will you see in practice that burden the children that we see, that burden the families, that's 
whether that's living in poor neighborhoods and having lower educational attainment or parents that can't access stable employment, which then leads to communities with concentrated low income. And of course, we know that that's also associated with negative health outcomes. So these things begin to point to specific sectors, not just behaviors of individuals, but what are the supports and the buffers that are being put in place by these systems that actually support these outcomes? So housing, education, economic development, access to care. These are the pillars of community resilience. And this is how we get to the individual level of resilience. That again, reinforcing this understanding that it takes a multi-sector response to deal with these multi-dimensional issues. And so when we understand that it's these different sectors, then we can begin to understand how these sectors really create these components of community resilience, how information and communication flows across agencies and providers, but also as Jill was speaking to about parents being able to advocate for their needs, well then how is this not just a lateral means of communication, but also vertical? How are individuals able to access the information or the supports that they need? The community's competence in advocating for their needs, that social capital that they have to be able to demand from systems what they need, but also a bit of social cohesion that individuals are being supported in the environments so that they can bounce back, those social relationships that provide buffers. One of the things we rarely talk about, particularly from a public health perspective, beyond the access to healthcare, behavioral health, is also this ladder to move, to move up. And that is very much dependent upon economic development. And so if we're gonna talk about equity, if we're gonna talk about truly putting in supports and buffers in place for individuals to move forward, then we have to be looking critically at what are those economic, those levers of economic success, economic mobility that are dependent upon economic development in our communities. These are the capacities for bouncing back. And they're based on a, a, a full literature of understanding how we predict how well communities have bounced back after disaster and prepare in an emergency preparedness. So you see, when we take this multidisciplinary approach to understanding resilience at the community level, it's not just from a public health perspective, but it's also from a public safety and almost to a certain extent to a public defense science. Understanding all of these sciences and how they inform from a public health perspective how we can prevent adversity in the first place. So on the flip side of that infographic that I showed you before, how we can measure adversity, we can also measure the flip of that. We can measure resilience. And we can think from a community's perspective, how would we know that we're being successful and providing the supports and buffers to help our families not only bounce back, but prevent adversity in the first place? What does resilience look like? Does that mean that we have fewer children in foster care, that we have fewer justice involved youth, that we would have fewer youth in mental health crisis, and that our families would have, would be able to draw upon their strengths because there are many more strengths that they can draw upon from community. That our systems, that root system is very much connected and it's drawing upon these nutrients that ensure all of our children have medical homes, that guarantee access to good nutritious food, that are providing perhaps school-based healthcare and promoting working class job growth. These are the indices for resilience, access to care, food security, economic mobility, stable housing. These things are all related to, as Jill described earlier, about parental stress, toxic stress. The absence of these things very much so contribute to toxic stress. So when we're screening for adversity, we should all be also be screening for these factors that contribute to resilience. What is it that our families have access to that they can draw upon for strength? And let's build upon that. So that's gonna take us to our breakout groups where we're gonna work on our pair of ACEs tree and begin to ask some critical questions with regard to helping us incorporate the pair of ACEs in practice. What are the leaves and branches on our tree? in our practice, what's in our soil, and how will we go about building across different sectors and with different partners, 
a much richer soil base to build for a much stronger tree. So I'm gonna turn it over to one of the Nicoles that will help us break into our breakout groups. Great, thanks Wendy. Um, so I'm gonna open up the breakout rooms in just a moment and each group has a designated facilitator who's gonna uh, guide you through uh, a, a pretty quick discussion, but we just want to set the stage saying that we don't expect that you'll get all the way through all the questions, but really we want to kind of build on this momentum based on what we've been hearing this morning. Again, we see this as just the beginning of an ongoing conversation that we'll continue to have. Um, so we just ask you to treat this like a brainstorm, share as many thoughts and ideas as you can because our facilitators will be trying to capture that for us. Um, I am gonna say that once I open the breakout rooms, there might be some people, like if you, you should automatically be sent to your breakout room. Um, we have about 25 minutes for this and then you'll automatically come back to the breakout room. You don't have to press anything, do anything. If you find that you don't go or get sent to a breakout room and you're still in this room and you still see me, it probably means that either there's something on uh, your technology side that we'll have to, uh, figure out or match up, uh, make sure if you're on a phone that you're matched up with your video in the same room. So uh, we're gonna cross our fingers and hope this all goes well. <laughs> Facilitators, you all have your worksheets ready and ready to <laughs> your people. Okay, I'm gonna open all the rooms now. Okay, so Wendy is going to lead us through a, just a short debrief before we start talking about next steps. Yeah. So um, now that we're all back together, you know, one of the things that um, we were very intentional about when we first started the building community resilience work and certainly the intentionality around the process is that we take all these big theories about adversity, about resilience and social determinants of health and collective impact and make it practical, something that we can actually do something about. And so I think, you know, from your perspective, I hope that by not just giving you the overview and some introduction to the tools and resources, but actually hearing from partners just like you, who started just where you're starting, but maybe five years ago, have been able to put this into practice helps you to begin to think about how to make this approachable, meaning the screening of ACEs in practice, but absolutely changing outcomes for our families. So I wanna give our Spanish language partners an opportunity to pose, to provide some of their feedback first around, you know, what in going through this process and thinking through, you know, the Parabasis worksheet, what do you anticipate that you're gonna see on the leaves and the branches and how are you prepared or perhaps not prepared and who will you bring to the table to, to really be effective in this ACEs screening and ultimately in this effort to build resilience? So anyone can share. But, for what, but like I said, I wanna start perhaps with our Spanish language partners first. Hello, this is Alicia from First Five. So I kind of uh, took the lead on the Spanish group. And I think what we talked a lot about was um, uh, legal status in terms of how that affects and what kind of changes would need to be made in order to uh, to make a difference. And um, we kind of talked about, you know, there's things that here in our county are very good and are positive and are going towards that direction of, um, you know, uh, having services be more available to the community. Uh, but then again, uh, how it is that, you know, the cost of living and not getting that support that other that other, that other people with legal status could get, how that affects. So we focused a lot on that. Um, when we talked about kind of how to measure if we were, you know, if we, what kinds of things we could implement, um, we struggled a little bit in kind of trying to figure out what, what kinds of things could make a difference. Um, but we thought that definitely sometimes there are resources available and the lack of knowing about those resources sometimes has a big effect um, and just maybe having making more people aware of what's out there um, and kind of um, 
where to find that, that information would be a, a, a good start. We did uh, kind of focus a lot on, like I said, that, that there are a lot of great services here um, and just kind of, I think we were struggling a little bit about, okay, how would we measure a success it, for the specific, um, in terms of really, you know, figuring out uh, if it was making a difference in terms of like what programs were involved. I think it, it was just a lot of brainstorming, but we didn't come up across the, I don't know how to say it. We always, it was, it was a good conversation, but I think we, we needed more time. We were kind of cut off. Short. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the measures piece of that is what is so critical for all of us, um, particularly when we talk about for financial sustainability piece of this, you know, how do we translate what we know is good work that's having impact in um, our communities and our population um, that we serve into something that resonates with whether that's funders that are private funders or you know public funders. And so I think you're really smart to think at the very outset, what are the measures that we are going to have impact on? And if we start with measures that are already our performance measures and think about how our activities will feed into either reducing some of these key indices of burden or improving some of these key indices of efficacy, that's a really great place to start because then you can kind of build out from there, not only what is your contribution, but what potentially are the contributions of others so that we can have a, a shared means of accountability, but also a shared means of success and understanding what success is gonna look like. Um, so anyone else wanna share from one of the groups? I have a question. Um, you know, we heard from the Cincinnati group about this idea of how do we begin to coach advocacy and build advocacy and efficacy in parents. So did any of you all think about what might be some of the barriers to being able to engage with parents in that manner? Um, my, my group uh, had some thoughts about uh, actually having in, in schools someone really dedicated to be a bridge between schools and families, someone like a manager, supervisor, but really identifying someone to act as that bridge. I don't know if um, the Cincinnati team might want to speak to some of the successes that they had, some of the tactics that they used um, with other community partners and kind of building that bridge of trust with, pa with parents. You know, Wendy, I think that um, Trust is at the root of all of this work and that without trust, um, we can't work together. We also are recognizing that we have to lean on community and listen well in order to understand what the real issues are and how we might be able to work together to solve problems. And, and so um, I think that translates into um, having some humility and recognizing that um, we have to listen. And um, Wendy, you and I were in a session earlier today where we talked about power and a lot of this comes down to who has the power and recognizing that we have to address those issues before we can get down to a true collaboration. In um, practice, what we did was we invite and we still do invite anyone who wants to participate in this to work with us. And um, the work is really led by um, those um, members of our group. One of the things, Wendy, that we still have yet to do a better job in Cincinnati is connecting with parents and community members who are not working with families. We have started that, but it's a slow process. And um, we are, um, we're beginning with understanding what language works. We just completed a project uh, asking our community champions after they learned about ACEs, um, how would they describe it? How does, what kind of language works with um, 
their uh, neighbors and community members and our community champions design language around ACEs education. And we're testing that out right now to see what resonates and see if it fosters continued conversation. Mm -hmm. And this very much is, is exactly in the uh, spirit of what you just said is that we are hoping to build a whole cadre of, of soldiers, if you will, champions who will address this issue of childhood adversity and the need to build resilience to improve outcomes. It's, it's slow work, there's nothing fast about it but it's very meaningful. I'm glad that you brought up this morning's conversation. So what Bill, I mean, Bob is alluding to is um, the Cincinnati group is actually um, piloting a process of truth and reconciliation with our center to really get to these difficult community conversations about the truth of racial oppression. And we are leveraging our fostering equity tools particularly starting with a power analysis. And I do, you know, our third part of the series that we're gonna do with this group is really gonna go at the heart of being able to have those community conversations. And so a power analysis is going to be part of the exercise that we do with you all. But I think that it's never too early to really be even cognizant of the different levels of power, um, whether that's within our practice or, you know, with patient and provider or, within community. Uh, and, and humility is such an important tool that we can use. It's, it's not just humbling ourselves, but it's just being making ourselves a little smaller so that we can actually see some things that perhaps we would have overlooked or if we were talking, we couldn't hear. And I'm just wondering if any of that came out. I see in the chat, there's one group that talked about cultural humility, but you know, how do we even define cultural differences? Are we merely just looking at different racial differences or are we looking at differences even from block to block? There are different cultures within different schools and how do we become cognizant of those differences so we can be more effective in community? I'm just wondering if anyone, you know, began to think through that about, you know, even how we define community in this work. Wendy? Yeah, yeah, so I just want to follow up on what Dr. Shapiro said and what our group, what we talked about in our group. I think one of the things that he referred to was voices, like having a voice. And so sort of to answer that question, one of the things we talked about was where we've shifted, we need to shift our focus from just youth engagement to family engagement. And by doing that, we need to lift up the voices of the parents and the guardians and hear from them how can we support them in this new way? Our group was sort of focused on COVID related educational issues, but I think it's all one big discussion really, if you think about it. And so what we're doing in Santa Cruz County is we're reshaping sort of some of our approaches in really working with the family and providing a voice. And so we've started doing focus groups with families and we've started, what you do next with that is the most important thing. So you get the families to weigh in and if they say, for example, in Santa Cruz, the most important thing is academic assistance. We need tutoring, we need support for our kids. So they're talking about the youth, but we're hearing it from the parents. And what we do next with that is how we change our approach and how we reshape the work. And I think it's really lifting up the families and moving from just youth engagement approaches to family engagement approaches mm -hmm. and letting the family have a voice. And and I think that will actually capture some of the things we're talking about culturally as well, as you start to promote more dialogue and then you show results with that. And so we're working really closely with our school systems in a new way. We're working really closely with our County Office of Education, but what we're really putting out front is the voices of our families. Thank you for sharing that, Rob. So Nicole, I want to be cognizant of the time and I know you wanted to go over next steps, but I first just want to thank all of you, it's still 119 people that have stuck with us through this. Uh, I really want to applaud you for sticking with this and joining in this conversation. I recognize too that this process requires a level of vulnerability. It requires a level of acknowledgement that perhaps we don't know everything and it's okay. 
um, we will learn together. And so, you know, on behalf of our partners at Joining Forces for Children, Cincinnati Children's um, Hospital and Beach Acres, as well as um, the Center for Community Resilience, I just wanna thank you for inviting us to be with you on this journey. And we look forward to the next two sessions. Thank you so much, Wendy. And, and I just wanna, I think I speak for all of us that are still left on the call here and, and everyone that joins today, just how grateful we are also and that, um, that you would, you know, visit little Santa Cruz County here and, and help us launch this learning series that, you know, you can tell just from the comments in the chats and, and the kinds of discussions everyone had in their groups, just, um, you know, that this concept of the parabases and the tools that you have to offer, I think can be of uh, a lot of value to us in our community. So we thank you for that. We're really looking forward to the next steps, which is a great segue to uh, letting you know what's coming up and, and uh, encourage you to save these dates. So on January 14th, Wendy and her colleagues will be coming back and uh, talking about connecting across sectors. And, uh, and I believe that session's focusing even uh, to a greater degree on policy as a, as a lever for change. So that's, I know that speaks to a lot of us on this call who are very involved in that kind of collaborative, collective impact type of work where we're looking at um, systemic changes. And then in February, we have the third series or session that Wendy and her colleagues will be doing with us, Connecting ACEs, Equity, and Resilience. Um, so again, I'm, I know that uh, there's so many tools that the Center for Community Resilience has that are going to, I think, be so relevant to all of us in our community and hopefully feel very complementary to the work we're already doing. Um, so we hope you'll come back and join us for those next two sessions and then save the dates for these other sessions in March and April. We um, are really going to listen to and, and look at some of the feedback from these initial sessions to see uh, what kinds of topics will be most relevant to focus on at those future sessions. Um, Christine has shared a couple links in the chat. Uh, we actually have already opened up the registration for the January 14th session. So if you loved what we did today, I encourage you to click on uh, the link in either English or Spanish and reserve your spot now. It'll be similar to today's setup. And then we would also really love to get your feedback about today. Um, so you'll see again, a couple links in the chat uh, to a survey. Um, one in English and then a, another link to the survey in Spanish. Um, you'll see some of you might feel like that they're asking quite similar questions that you have to fill out in the registration form as well. But it's um, part of our grant reporting requirements to be collecting <laughs> a lot of data. Um, so please bear with us and, and fill that out for us. That would be super helpful. And, and again, we'll, we'll look at all that feedback to help us um, understand what worked well about today's session, what we might want to improve, what else we, we could be doing in between these learning sessions. And we certainly hope that all of you will stay involved with us. Um, and so this, these are our next steps here. And the recordings in both English and Spanish and the slides from today will be sent out uh, probably early next week. We still have to translate some of the slides. So we will get that out to everybody that registered, uh, even if they didn't attend the live session. So we encourage you to share those with your colleagues, even if they didn't attend as well, and share the registration links for January as well. We're always looking to, we, we know that um, there are, we, we had a pretty comprehensive invitation list for today, and still we know there are a lot of other people out there that we probably missed. And so uh, we want to include as many people as possible. So with that, I'll just see, uh, David, is there anything you want to say as our closing words? I don't have any prepared comments, so I'll just say that I'm tremendously gratified for the participation that we had in today's meeting. I was inspired by Wendy and Harrison's words and, and wisdom, and really, really grateful to the Cincinnati team for spending all the time that they did with us to just give us a practical example of thinking through this framework into action and how it's not done, but it's an ever evolving and ongoing process to create equity, justice, um, and well-being in our communities. So thank you all. 
Thank you to all of our facilitators. We could not have done this without you. So thank you, thank you. Uh, we'll follow up with you also next week. And um, thank you, Stella, for interpreting. Even though we can't see you, we know you're there. <laughs> uh, and Nicole and Christine for also providing all that backup uh, Zoom support. It really does take a, a team to make it uh, go smoothly. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Nice to see everyone. Thank you. And please complete the survey. <laughs> thank you.